Coming up next on this week in computer hardware, 960 gigabytes of SSD glory. Thunderbolt bandwidth doubles as well, whatever. Adobe embraces OpenCL. Do you need an MSATA on your motherboard and more? It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 213, recorded April 11th, 2013. 960 gigs of SSD glory. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting is a new mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting, where you pay for what you use. It doesn't require a contract and offers unlimited devices on one pooled plan. To save $25 on your first Ting device, visit twitch.ting.com. That's twitch.ting.com. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, the Twitch show that aims to bring you the most important, useful, and friendly news in computer buying advice available anywhere in audio format. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by Mr. Ryan Shrout. Are you there, sir? Uh, hey. Doing well. Doing good. Doing well. There was nearly an incident that might involve mentioning a certain basketball team of infamy in front of Mr. Shrout, but I'd like to report that that was a terrible audio glitch, possibly... Mm. Mm -hmm. possibly put together just by got, something got something got rerouted in the in the uh in the connection between you and i across the country so i understand it's okay not a problem never happen again serious pc performance tip for everybody out there especially you ryan ryan's big in the pc performance he loves the faster graphics he has the fastest cpus available but he may not know that every pc macintosh or windows will always run faster when it's plugged in or if it's a laptop with the battery inserted. Just want to get that out there for everybody. <laughs> uh, they will function much better when, a, when, uh, when they have a good power source behind them. I'll agree with that. Any power source. I don't know source. what prompted it, but I agree with that statement. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, certainly had nothing to do with the podcast starting a few minutes late today. <laughs> From the what? Okay. Want, 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 want so much want department. I don't know who mentioned this on the PC Per Podcast last night, but a crucial M500 960 gigabyte. No, not a hard drive. An SSD, two and a half inch, seven millimeter, two and a half inch, seven millimeter SSD pack and 960 gigabytes, $599.99 up on Newegg. And it just went out of stock in the last 10 minutes. Oh, well, really? It was in stock for you today? I swear it was when I pulled it up. Okay. That may have been hallucination. Last, or last, night, last night it was out of stock for us too, but it had been in stock earlier in the day as well. Um, and actually, I think I saw this for $50 less at some point in the last 48 hours or so. Because we were actually in the $0.50 cents per gigabyte range, like $0.58, $0.59 uh, cents per gigabyte, um, which is really impressive. You know, I can't afford one. But I want one really badly. Oh, 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 oh. Here we go. It is available on Amazon. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. It's, I mean, it's it's a great deal. It's a good uh, cost per gigabyte for sure. Um, right. But it is still an incredibly expensive component, right? True. So you think about, you're spending $600 on any one component, whether that's the motherboard, the processor, the graphics card. That's you right. know, going to definitely swing the you know, the per performance per dollar value of your of your system. Um, but in terms of being able to get an SSD in your system and have right. it be your only drive or something like that, this is this is where this is where you gotta go. So and I'm looking awesome. like they have the, I mean the jump so it's six hundred dollars for the nine hundred and sixty gig version, which right. is like um, let me do my quick math, sixty two cents per gig. But the uh, four, 480 gig version is uh -huh. actually 83 cents per gig. So it's dramatically more expensive in terms of cost. Um, so, you know, it's, you're, it's actually, it's hard to say that. It's, it's not an awful deal to spend $600. <laughs> it is a relative expense. bargain should you need the maximum capacity on an SSD. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's just like, I, I, on one hand, I feel your pain. On the other hand, it's like, terabyte SSDs, so excited, <laughs> so expensive. Like, you it's, know, 
I, I love me some $500 gaming machines, and I think my last system cost me like 750 bucks uh, with a Core i7-920, so. This would dramatically change that price. Dramatically change <laughs> that. Speaking of dramatic changes, or maybe not so dramatic changes, Haswell continues to slink towards release, uh, being delayed once again. Quote, Haswell, we have a problem. USB 3.0 woes may lead to delays, writes Jeremy up on PCPro.com, Jeremy Hellstrom. Uh, Hardware.info has recently had confirmation of the rumors we have heard about Intel's USB 3.0 chipset in Haswell. The problem exists. It will cause delays. Um, and, and Jeremy goes out to point out that this is so, so like the P55 boards and their SATA controller issues. The nice thing is this time the problems were caught before the boards went to market. Yeah. Um, you know, and on one hand, I'm not, you know what I mean? This is, this is not a, this is not a big, massive, you know what I mean? I'm not going to, I'm not looking at Haswell and thinking, oh, this is going to be the most epic performance upgrade ever. I'm mostly thinking like, well, everybody I know is thinking about building a new Hackintosh or they're thinking about do, building a new gaming rig. They're kind of like, well, should I wait for Haswell? Should I wait for Haswell? And it seems longer it Haswell takes, the more the answer is no, just get your freaking system now. Am I insane or am I just no, over I'm, Haswell already? And I'm not. I really don't even think they're going to delay the release of Haswell because of this. Okay. I, I think they might delay some key parts. So the issue that is that that um, that this problem actually entails is that um, USB 3.0 devices are not recognized after waking up from an S3 sleep state, and so it's bad. It's it's bad for desktop users. Probably not nearly as big of a deal. Um, right. Not very often is a desktop machine going into an S3 sleep state, uh, but you know when it does happen, obviously you would like your USB devices to work. This only applies to USB 3, not USB 2. So a couple ways they could get around this. The initial wave of Haswell laptops would maybe only have USB 2.0 ports. Or no. uh, the initial wave of Haswell laptops would only be kind of like high-end gaming systems that, you know, aren't as likely to fall into this trap of going into an S3 sleep state or something like that. Um, they're going to delay some parts. And I think, especially if you get into, you know, the super thin ultra books where people are really, really concerned about long battery life, they're going to be putting them to sleep quite a bit rather than shutting them down or something like that, that it would right. be more of an issue. Um, but, uh, I mean, it affects pretty much the whole range of chipsets, Z87, H87, Q87, all the 85s, all the integrated uh, mobile uh, embedded stuff like the C22, C222 and 224. Mm -hmm. um, so it says their their official statement is that they're going to delay select products, but they didn't mm -hmm. really detail what those select products might be. Hmm. So we'll, we'll know more. Uh, <laughs> we wait with bated breath. Um, it's funny. Uh, I'm really excited about Thunderbolt. Uh, I'm even more excited about Thunderbolt thinking about what uh, Intel uh, was talking about. Basically, the the, the new uh, another Jeremy Hellstrom article up at PCPro.com. Uh, the new Falcon Ridge Thunderbolt controller will be arriving soon. Uh, the big thing is doubling of bandwidth 20 gigabits per second, uh, which basically means Thunderbolt can kick ESAT's ass and it'll provide signal yeah. to a monitor without damaging that bandwidth to the hard drive. Um and uh, in, a, in, in something, as Jeremy points out, it's a business thing. You and I probably won't care. They're, they're promising uh, the same 10 gigabit performance with a lower power consumption, i.e. something that's great if you're doing giant, giant server rigs or something uh, for businesses. And the Inquirer article this is based on also suggests mentions that Intel is still looking to replace copper with fiber optics because Thunderbolt originally started as a fiber optic platform that got moved to copper. Um, and then, and then, you know, what that would do to the already ridiculous price of Thunderbolt cables. And it was kind of funny because I found, uh, uh, I found a quick link, uh, to, uh, Canex live and I'm like, okay, so a branded cable that a half meter Thunderbolt cable is down to $29 and a one meter cable is down to $35. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, the price That's not really any points. less. I ordered Apple cables, half meter, 29, yeah. two meter, 39. I yeah, but when they sh when they shipped, Thunderbolt cables were like one meter for they fifty were, bucks. Yeah, you're right. You're right. They were they were at least ten bucks more expensive. So um, they're, they're slouching towards affordability. That's going to be the so word 20, of the day. The 20, to, put that in, to put that in perspective, the the twenty the twenty gigabits per second 
equates to 2.5 gigabytes per second, which is, you know, more than enough bandwidth for, <laughs> for pretty much everything you can do right now. So, like, the, the quote from Intel uh, about the release or the preview of the Falcon Ridge is that, okay, this is, this is prepping the industry for um, simultaneous 4K video file transfer and display at the same time. Uh, with with uh, shipping in late 2013, with ramp up in 2014. So this is a a huge increase. The conversation we had last night was whether or not we actually think just Falcon. In my opinion, Falcon Ridge doesn't make it more appealing to the consumer. It makes it right. modestly more appealing to the professional user because you can always use a little bit more bandwidth. But you know, I have one Thunderbolt device in here that we use that kind of pushes that you know, six, 700, 800 megabytes per second use case scenario. And it's right. very niche, right? So I don't, I don't really <laughs> think, I think the 20 gigabit per second doesn't help consumer adoption. The lower power consumption at cheaper costs for implementation may help increase, you know, actual consumer adoption. But I don't, still don't see anything that really is spiking the general public's interest in this way. At least not with USB out there, USB 3.0 out there. The majority of users are still using rotating rotating media on their external devices. Um, yeah. If everybody was running SSDs in place of rotating hard drives or their external drives, then all of a sudden Thunderbolt gets really, really compelling. Because the idea of if you could actually fill the 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 2.5 gigabytes per second capacity, I think that ends up being a six minute, six and a half minute transfer of a one terabyte hard drive. Um, which would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I can do the math. Um, it's funny. They also, Intel also showed it off at NAB, uh, basically the, the DSL 4510, 4410, and the Falcon Bridge, 20 gigabits per second. Were you over at, at NAB, Ryan? No, no, I didn't, I didn't okay. go. But it makes sense that they would show it at this particular show, right? Because that is right. the video production headquarters in terms of <laughs> uh, where you're going to catch those people that would really, really be interested in a 20 gigabit per second data connection right yeah i just I know like a lot of uh, editors who would be all over that i i but i have i have the 10 gigabit version with uh, a raid zero array of four ssds and i really can't saturate it um with with what we're doing so to me 20 gigabit is better for multiple devices maybe not necessarily for a single thing and i'm not working in 4k video yet so basically you're saying this is another case where we have a giant pipeline o bandwidth and we're filling it with a teaspoon yeah, but I, okay. trust me, I'm a proponent of over-exaggerating <laughs> hardware performance and letting right. software and innovation fill that in as the years go on, right? So right. Uh, that's what happened with GPU performance. That's what's still happening with GPU performance. That's what happened with CPU performance. We've kind of tapered off. Um, but, you know, and so while I can say that I don't really see any uses for 20 gigabit per second today, now there's a now there's a software company out there that's like oh I know what I can do with with that much bandwidth for a professional <laughs> user that may eventually trickle down to a consumer, right. um, so good on them. Speaking of uh, GPU performance and NAB, another write up from Ryan up on PCPro.com. Um, it's interesting uh, quote earlier today Adobe revealed some of its next generation professional video and audio products, including the next version of Adobe Premiere Pro, which is what we edit with now here at Revision 3. Uh, Techzilla is edited on Premiere Pro. Uh, and it's interesting because Adobe is looking at the next version of Premiere Pro, uh, acceleration with AMD Fire Pro 3D workstation graphics and OpenCL versus NVIDIA Quadro workstation graphics and CUDA. And if you scroll down, basically they're like, hey, it's up to 27% faster with OpenCL versus CUDA. Um, now, this is ridiculous video specs, 4K TIFF 24-bit sequence content. Those are massive frames of massive video files. Uh, Microsoft Windows 7, 64-bit, uh, Xeon E5530, uh, 12 gigabytes of system memory. And they used a bunch of FirePro GPUs uh, using OpenCL versus NVIDIA Quadro options versus CUDA. And as Ryan points out, ideally, quote, we would like to see some OpenCL NVIDIA benchmarks as well, but I assume we'll have to wait to test that here at PC Perspective, unquote. Are you suggesting that a GPU vendor might be putting their product in the very best light possible? I would not only suggest <laughs> that, I would guarantee it that they would be making sure to only show the benchmarks that are best case for them and then all that kind of stuff. But it's very yeah. compelling to think of, okay, are we finally getting to that first major use case where a software developer is going to adopt OpenCL, which would make it cross-platform compatible, NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, all that, you know, mm -hmm. anybody that has an OpenCL 
driver stack would be able to run and accelerate this type of software as opposed to, you know, we currently use uh, Premiere Pro CS5, I guess, still. And it's back end, you know, kind of rendering engine, the Mercury playback engine is CUDA based. So we chose to use a Quadro card and that kind of stuff right. for those specific reasons. Um, and, and now if we can open up that option to our Fire Pro cards and our Quadro cards, and we can do other things with different systems. And now, okay, now we don't have to select which laptop we are going to take with us to CES based on, you know, if it has an AMD or an NVIDIA GPU in it. That all that all kind of stuff <laughs> is what I would like to right. see. And the current generation of uh, desktop graphics cards, AMD mm -hmm. has a much better GPGPU compute platform than the GeForce 600 cards have. So um, they, they if this... <laughs> happens quickly they could have a pretty good advantage that would be nice yeah that would be very especially because we just built a giant stack of boxes just for uh, uh video editing um we love mini itx motherboards and a particularly delightful looking one the asus p877 no 8z77i deluxe mini itx motherboard what does this cost and and is it i mean is is at this point is anybody doing decent roundups of 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 mini itx uh um, motherboards like is, is there any like there's a sentence we done, in here well, I was gonna say we haven't <laughs> done any roundups but we've right. done quite a few mini ITX reviews um, we, we've, we've done a review of a Gigabyte one an MSI one an right. Asus one kind of like their flagship mini ITX platforms there's one more for uh, and actually we did one of EVGA I think as well so we don't have any roundups but I think we have individual reviews of most of the Z77 mini ITX platforms out on the market today and, and the truth that like the, this asus board is actually really right. really nice it has almost the same feature set and uh it even has a lot of overclocking capability that the full size boards have um you can see on the right hand side there that kind of raised portion is actually all the voltage regulation stuff that would mm -hmm. usually be around uh the pcb around the processor on the pcb uh, is actually raised on a separate Separate little riser card type thing, yeah, and and it's it's a really it's a really interesting design. It's um, it allows the motherboard to be small but still have a lot of uh, of great features. The the BIOS is the same. It has the same features and capabilities. It's got a full size PCI Express slot and wireless and um, all that kind of stuff. So it's it's uh, they're not cheap, right? Even though they're small, they're not cheap. I think that one's like one hundred and eighty or one hundred ninety dollars. But you, you get a lot more than I think people think you get on many ITX platforms today. I guess the thing I was I doing such a poor job of articulating a moment ago is, is are you really losing much in performance or anything in performance compared to a full-size ATX motherboard? Or is I don't it basically think so anymore. Picking, basically picking and choosing to make sure all the ports or additional features you want are on there. Exactly. I think from a performance standpoint, you maybe lose a little bit, but only in terms of overclocking performance. If you're looking at stock performance... No, I don't think you're losing anything. You know, uh, you're where you, where maybe that that consideration comes in is you only have two DIMM slots, so right. uh, you know you you're kind of limited on your memory, right? So you have to get two eights, and you can't add two more eights later, right? So you you, you right. can you know be more conscious of what you're doing there. But otherwise, no, I think the um, the performance you get is going to be the same. You know, just as as, like, as you said, is just make sure it has all the features you want, right? Does it have USB right. three? Yes. Oh, I actually need Firewire. Well, the mini ITX boards aren't going to have that, so you're going to have to move on to something else. No Firewire. Next thing you'll tell me is I can't run three GPUs on it. Um, it happens. Gosh darn it. Speaking of G G GPUs, um, speaking of processors and cooling, uh, yeah. speaking of small motherboards and doing cool things with them, um, the G-Lid? Gelid, Gelid, it's a Hong Kong-based PC cooling company. Um, it's a actual slim cooler. Because we're getting so used to it at this point is turning around and saying like, "Look, it's a CPU cooler. It's only 220 centimeters tall. I mean, or millimeters. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's like it's ridiculous. The size of CPU coolers has gone basically ridiculous, right? They're yep. they're going for huge surface area." using the whatever movement of air inside the case uh, fan to disperse the air. And they're huge. And this is going completely in the opposite direction. It's a low-profile uh, CPU uh, cooler, 131 by 123 by 59 millimeters. So it's like less than two inches high, including the fan. Weighs 352 grams because 
you might need to carry it somewhere. And it's the Slim Hero Cooler, four copper heat pipes connecting a copper block to a horizontal aluminum fin array, writes Tim Berry on PC Per. Uh, and then basically they strap a 120 millimeter fan on top of the heat sink to push air over the fins and the VRM area around the processor. Uh, up to 136 TDPs compatible with all of Intel's and AMD's latest consumer sockets. So AM2, AM2, so AM2, AM3, AM3 Plus, FM1, FM2, uh, LGA775, 1156, 1366, and 1155 sockets. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's nice to actually see something that you can fit inside of a smaller case or a more compact case. I'll be curious to see what the performance is like and whether or not it, you know, if if to have the same amount of cooling in a smaller package means a much louder fan noise. Uh, I laugh, but partially I made the joke earlier about, you know, the, the PC works much better if it's plugged in, you know, but I've got this uh, Puget system they loaned us, this Serenity, and even when it's gaming, it's almost impossible to tell that the computer is plugged in unless you yep. look for the lights because it is, it is that quiet. So Yep. I, I had that exact same system in, and I, I agree. It was, it was a little unnerving almost, but in a good way. Is that a bug or a feature? <laughs> I was talking about... Uh, should we take a moment, actually, uh, to thank our sponsor, Ting, right now? Yeah, yeah, let's do okay. that. Um, so... We, we get the capability to bring this show to you uh, on an almost every week basis. We take a couple of holidays off, but we, uh, we, we're, we're pretty good about uh, making sure that we have content here for you every week. And we, we can we do that because of our sponsors like Ting. Ting Thanks, is Ting. a uh, mobile service. You've heard us talk about it several times, I think. Uh, Patrick is a current Ting user. I and uh, has had very, very good experiences with it. It's a no BS mobile service. It's an MVNO, <laughs> which basically is a, a reseller of services from one of the major carriers. In this case, it's actually the Sprint Network. But mm -hmm. it's different because there's no contracts. There's no ETFs. Uh, it's truly and completely contract-free, they say. There's no early, term early termination fees, anything like that. You don't have to bundle. There's no ride-along services. You actually select your plan from extra small through extra, extra large, and you can do it all through their web interface. Um, and you're selecting individual service levels for voice minutes, text messages, right. megabytes of data, all built separately. You don't have to worry about, well, I don't really need text messages, <laughs> but in order to get the better deal, I need to get um, two, at least 200 text messages to get that phone bundle plan. They don't do any of that, and it makes things super, super easy. No overage charges or penalties. If well, it's you use funny more than you thought you would, you just kind of pay for that next ring of... Yeah, of well, uh, I mean, I've been paying like three bucks a month, like nine bucks total for my service, right? I think it's like three dollars, <laughs> maybe six bucks. No, six, nine dollars because it's six bucks for the device and three dollars for the fee. It's compared to a $60 a month Sprint bill, it's ridiculously cheap. Right. Um, but I basically chose you know, I think 100 megabytes per month. You could choose zero megabytes per month. You'll still pay your monthly fee for the device. And the way they do this, by the way, is, is you you purchase your hardware. They're breaking the traditional U.S. model. T-Mobile's actually kind of following them down this path where they're, they're basically saying, you own the device. We're not going to do fancy backroom accounting mayhem and make stupid money off of you for two years. We're going to charge you a fair price for your data. So so I finally got like a, you know, a, a $20 bill. And it's like, oh, wow. Well, I, I use the better part of a, a gigabyte of data. You know, and usually it's 100 megabytes here and 100 megabytes there. It's cheap. But the idea is that you pay as you go. So if you choose the extra small, the zero minutes a month, the zero text messages a month, the zero megabytes, and you do like 200 text messages, well, they're going to charge you, you know, five bucks. And if you do 2,000 text messages, they're going to charge you like eight bucks. And if you use no text messages, they're going to charge you no bucks. So the idea is that you're not <laughs> staring at like, oh boy, uh, I had two gigabytes a month, but I didn't use it. And I'm still paying my carrier 60 bucks. No. I, no. I unfortunately am guilty of that scenario almost exactly. Yeah, and it's great because, you know, if I'm at home, I'm using, you know, I'm using my cable. If I'm at work, I'm using a ridiculous connection we have here at work. I don't want to use, you know, I'm not going to use my wireless except when I'm traveling, yep. and I don't always travel. So I have it for emergency. I have it for business travel. But what I don't have is a giant drain on my wallet every month. So, ting, that's really cool. And it's, it's easy to get into. Um, the devices aren't that expensive. If you want to buy the fanciest new cell phones, you're going to spend a little bit more money. Um, you know, but I got into, because we got a nice little discount from our friends at Ting, uh, and I, 
Whoop, let me, let me, there it is. Okay, so Twitch viewers can actually sign up. If you, if you sign up at twitch, twich.ting.com, you'll get a $25 discount on your first Ting device when you sign up. And, you know, it's worth looking at. You know, I'm I'm looking at taking the wife and I because we have we have cell phones with another carrier, and I'm thinking about taking. According to the calculator on the Ting website, I could save like fifteen hundred dollars a year on our phone bill based on wow. our typical monthly usage and the plan we have by going to Ting. That's tempting, especially when you think about it. Don't think about it like this month. Think about it over the cost of two years or three years or however long you've been sitting with your phone on your provider, and you may think to yourself, "I need a better deal." <laughs> so twitch.ting.com and we want to take a, a, a moment a long moment a pause that refreshes to thank them for sponsoring twitch twitch.ting.com $25 off your first device save yourself some money on your wireless service just saying Indeed. just saying Dell uh, this I, it's funny I tweeted this out and I got a, a lot of response uh, on the Twitter uh, Dell adds Ubuntu systems to its Alienware gaming lineup. Um, you're, you're like, whatever. You're so not into this. <laughs> it, it seems kind of like a, um, like, like throwing a bone to that particular niche market, I guess. I don't know. Well, it's interesting, right? Cause it's Ubuntu. Okay. It, they started yeah. $600. Um, they're, they're basically compact mini systems. Uh, somebody, of course, almost immediately tweeted back, this is going to be the Steam box. Uh, and then it was like, oh, you know, if Valve is working on wine for game emulation, it's going to be amazing. Um, it's not a bad system for, you know, 600 bucks. It's a little toned down. You don't have the over-the-top insane Alienware style. It's pretty relaxed. 600 bucks gets you a Core i3-3220, uh, 6 gigs of DDR3, an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 6445, a DVD burner, wireless, uh, terabyte SATA drive. Drive. Um, that's actually a pretty good deal. Basically, a 7200 to one terabyte SATA drive. That's 600 bucks. Uh, you step up, you get uh, more memory at 749 uh, at a Core i5. And where did the GPU go? Don't you love when you can't read the GPU specs GTX anymore? Six, the GTX 660 and the highest end models. I was looking for. Yeah, basically the 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 basically the 850 and the and the 1049 models of the X51 are running the GTX 660. So it's not a, it's not a you know it's not a two thousand dollar computer. So it's not running two thousand dollar GPU or a thousand dollar GPU as the case may be. But I thought it was interesting to see somebody like Alienware being like, okay, we're going to support this. Uh, as somebody who's recently had an emotionally traumatizing experience uh, getting my uh, uh, my video card to run under Ubuntu. <laughs> And basically moving to Mint uh, as a result. Uh, I thought it. I thought it was interesting, you know. And and Dell's occasionally done uh, Linux-based notebooks or, or laptops or desktops on and off for years. But I thought it was interesting. I'm curious if there'll be more of this. I'm curious if uh, Linux gaming on Steam will continue to pick up pace, and then maybe the quality of GPU drivers uh, on Linux will will pick up the pace. Yeah, I, can I, I, I would be. I would. I think I'd be more interested in a platform from Alienware that, like, preloads dual booting. Right. Right. Something where they say, okay, we we want to encourage Linux gaming platform. Linux is a gaming platform, and I right. think that that's that's a great cause. But also, hey, we understand that there's going to be cases where that's not going to work out, and. Um, you know, here, here's a Windows install or something like that. And obviously, you know, you can always buy this system and do that yourself. But the whole idea of buying a pre-built rig like this is that it's supported, that, you know, it's right. out of the box functioning the way you want it to get. So, you know, maybe if they even had a, a in the software, it's like, okay, well, if you want to do that, you have to bring your own copy of Windows. And then we have a little in, uh, installer that kind of uh, partitions the drive and sets it up for you and has a bootloader all ready to go and that kind of stuff. That might be might be worth it as well because I, I, I am one of those people that needs to spend more time with this kind of Linux gaming environment to see how it's progressing over the months uh, in, the, in the past months and the, in the upcoming months. But I just set up frame rating I, I think, on it. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, well, you can definitely do that. It's just, it's a little, I find it a little disingenuous to, to somehow it seems like you're recommending, oh, hey, it's totally cool now to go all in on Linux gaming. And I don't really think that's the case. I think you'll have think a poor experience overall. I, I don't. I don't think they're saying go all in on Linux gaming. I think they're saying, hey, Linux gamers, we're going to build a box for you. There's a difference there, right? Yeah, that's that's fair. <laughs> Ryan's like, I'm going to sip my beverage, or maybe he's just vomited all over the floor in reaction to my splitting. Of I had uh, I had to get a, I had to get a cable that fell on the ground. I'm sorry. It happens. Um, no, better now. I'm, I'm glad you weren't just. Sick to your stomach at my my, my thought there. 
<laughs> Linux gaming makes Ryan Trout and PC Per sick. Not sick. Four terabyte hard drives. More of them are out there. Western Digital's black. Uh, the new 7200 uh, RPM, uh, the four terabyte hard drive. Last week we were talking about Seagate. This week it's Western Digital. 300 bucks, like $289 uh, online. So about 100 bucks more than the Seagate and using five platters instead of four. So it's got five uh, 800 gigabyte platters instead of four one terabyte platters. The interesting, interesting thing, especially if you take a look at the review up on the tech report, um, is yes, it's faster, 7200 RPM. Yes, it's got a big pile of cash, 64 megabytes. But uh, it also has, uh, which by the way, to put this into context, we talked about like the 50 cent per gigabyte mark on that 960 gigabyte drive earlier in the show or 47 cents a gigabyte. Now we're looking at seven cents a gigabyte for a four terabyte uh, rotating media drive. 7200 RPM spindle, five-year warranty coverage. So Western Digital expects this mm. drive to pretty much never die. So basically, you got three choices of four terabytes, the Seagate, uh, the Western Digital Black, and Hitachi's Desk Star 7K4000, uh, which runs a three-year warranty and also has a similar 7200 RPM spindle speed. Um, it was interesting, you know, the, the tech report's a little offended that the Seagate only has a two-year uh, warranty as compared to the three-year on the Hitachi and five-year on the Western Digital. I mean, do, do you think, do you think the, 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 the Seagate's going to be that much less reliable uh, than the Western Digital? Uh, it's, I mean, it's impossible to say. Um, <laughs> What the Seagate is the one with the four platters, right? So right. it it has a little bit more advanced technology, I guess I will say. It's a little bit more right. untested of the technology because they have increased the platter density more. So there's maybe a little bit more potential risk there, um, but I, I don't think it will be that that big of a deal. I think yeah. long term, it's. I mean, Nobody, you can't say for way. sure. There there are rashes of hard drive failures. <laughs> They go back years and years and years, and it's it's right. almost impossible to just try to predict them. So, I good point. I also point out that they have not tested. It's kind of funny because you know they they, they make a big deal of the spindle speed uh, of some of the competitors, but uh, they have not tested. Uh, as far as you know, they have not tested the Hitachi or the Seagate in terms of performance. Um, but it's pretty fast. Cause say the Seagate Barracuda. Uh, where did it go? Where did it go? Where did it go? If you take a look at, we're looking at like HD tune write speed here, uh, where a three terabyte Seagate Barracuda is smoking uh, the rest of the competition uh, in terms yeah. of write speed. Like the 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 WD Black four terabytes, like 150 megabytes per second. Uh, HD tunes 30 percent higher at like 200 megabytes per second. Obviously, it, it scales down, but if you start scrolling down at like oh write burst speed and stuff, you know, obviously <laughs> big shock. Um, the uh, SSDs are delivering uh, superior performance. But it's interesting, you know, as you start nosing around, looking at different benchmarks and different tests, uh, it's always really funny uh, how different the performance metrics are. But, yeah, I'd be curious. I'd really be curious to see the Seagate tested uh, for performance because the aerial density is pretty high on those drives. And I'd like to – I don't know, man. You know, is, is an extra 100 bucks for – you know, a five-year warranty? Is that a good trade-off? I don't think it would be for me, but I go through equipment maybe faster than the average right. viewer of uh, <laughs> Twitch as well. I mean, I, 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 think, I think those additional warranty terms kind of say, they, the idea is that consumers say it's, it's, a, it's a voice from the company of how confident they are in their products. Right. Um, and that's, you know... It, whether or not it actually relates to the reliability of the hardware is, is a totally different story, though. That's true. We got an email from James. We love your email. Oh, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Oh. You skipped the coolest thing of the show. <laughs> the couch master? Yes. My grandma had one of these for, for, for <laughs> breakfast serving. I don't... I, I mean, what? This is This is the... This was the highlight of uh, of the week for me. Was was the Nerdy Tech Couchmaster Premium? Tell me yeah. about this delicious. So there's a there's a video at the bottom of that thing. story, uh, Burke. <laughs> if you want to bring that up, um, it is essentially it's a it's a piece of furniture, I guess, that is made to uh, it's a lap help. Desk. 
yeah, but it's made for sitting on a couch and playing PC games, right? And it's always kind of a, the, you know, remember when last year I came up with the idea of I bought a uh, overbed hospital tray from right. Amazon and I used that and it, it had okay. some issues. It wouldn't quite go low enough. It couldn't get close enough to the uh, couch to really be um, super comfortable. This is essentially two styrofoam, I call them like floats, off to either side of your legs while you're sitting on the couch. And then a platform made out of like a, it's got a wood base, it's wrapped in a faux leather type thing. Uh, and it's nice and heavy, it doesn't move around or anything like that. And it just sits there and it's at a, at a decent angle and it's got you know, a place for a keyboard and a place for your mouse. And then if you, um, if we fast forward in the video a little bit, you'll see when you flip over that kind of center compartment, uh, you go a little bit further there, right, right, a little bit more, more, um, yeah, something right there is good. And so when you flip this unit over, as you'll mm -hmm. see here, when I take the keyboard and the mouse off of it, there's actually compartments. You see the cables going into it, and when you flip it over, there are actually compartments underneath that hide the cables. And it <laughs> comes with a comes with a USB hub. It comes with a uh, USB 3.0 extension cable, and it's. Um, it actually is, is kind of nice, right? And so you can hook up your keyboard and your mouse and your headset and all that kind of stuff. I can see that YouTube is not cooperating with the uh, studio. There we go. So, I mean, it's got these little compartments in there that just use Velcro. It's really easy to go in there and mo modify things and move them around. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, it works. I'm really it excited works, about this. It works is that a pretty USB nice. Hub? Yeah. Yeah, and it's a USB hub that doesn't require external power. Okay. Um, it, you know, I tried hooking up, like, an external hard drive to it, and that didn't work. Uh, didn't have enough juice to really power that, but keyboard, mouse, headset, you know, no problems with that. Um, and it's, uh, I, I played the entirety of Bioshock Infinite on my couch at uh, home using this. And other than getting some odd looks from Kelly, my wife, <laughs> you know, about, uh, you're not really going to keep that at the house, are you? Um, Aww. So it, it she she is adverse to anything that is uh, you know PC related in the living room I guess I'll say but it it, it was an incredibly comfortable experience the only suggestion okay. I had for them was that it needed a cup holder in it in some place right you know because that seems well they let you choose your 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 favorite leather colors can you go for something that, like well, there's compliments? all kinds of color there's all kinds of color options okay. they have one called Nerdy Tron which is like a Tron themed color scheme and that kind of stuff I'm sure it's not license or anything like that. Uh, they're made, the only, the only kind of drawback to it is it's, it's pretty expensive. Um, they're made in Germany. It's just it's like a small company that built it and sent one to us. Uh, and I think it's like 150 bucks or something like that. That's not, I mean, given as, as somebody who, who grew up by surrounded by the furniture industry, this is actually, there's some decent stitching going on here. They're, they're, yeah. they're doing some nice work. I mean, it's, it's pretty funny though. 150 you, to 170 bucks, depending on which model you get. And right. it's just, it's, I mean, it's it's incredibly simple. I've you know, in the, in the video we posted in the YouTube comments, there's like, oh, I could build this for fifty dollars. I guess <laughs> I guess you could, sure. Um, and well, they've and, got a and, microfiber one. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, they have a microfiber one. Like See, there, there's where I demonstrate where the cup holder should have been too. Um, but it, <laughs> but it works really nice. It's just uh, it's just a good. A kind of a it's, it's it's just a nice design of thing, and it's um, it's. People want to play. I think more and more people want to play their PC games in front of their big screen TV as opposed to at their desk. I'm definitely one of those people. Um, so I was glad to see that some of these unique devices are are kind of being developed and released. I will say the cable anyway. storage does give it a big advantage over the classic yeah. Levenger lap desk. I don't know if Burke caught the link in there, but Levenger has been selling these things for a thousand years, which is uh, a Levenger started as a store for book nerds, basically. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I don't know if, if, if Bert can pull that up, but it's basically a sheet of plywood, a very stylish sheet of furniture-grade plywood uh, cut in the shape of a bean. But you'd have oh, to go yeah, wireless. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. No, there's no, there it is. There it just popped up. You'd have, there's no cable management on that. Right. <laughs> But it is and, and honestly, I used I used the Couch Master for work as well. So you know, I can set my laptop on it where the keyboard is and the mouse on it, and it was comfortable for that while you know, writing some articles while watching sports on TV or something like that. You know, it's it's it is a little big. It's a little obnoxious looking uh, on the couch for sure. But ah, uh, I think if you're email a PC gamer, Kelly person. at PCPer.com <laughs> and save. The couch master. <laughs> she wasn't, she wasn't, let's say she wasn't let down. She wasn't disappointed when it found its way back here to record that video. I keep telling her it's going to come back home though. So Good luck, I don't sir. have a couch here. So what are you going to do?
Well, you can buy a couch for work. <laughs> put it in the <laughs> trunk and carry it home. Work. The home yeah. is at work. Twitch, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv is the email address. We love your questions. Please fire them in. Email, uh, our first email is from James. He's got a question about a PCI Express Generation 3 or PCI Gen 3. I'm currently running an Asus Sabertooth FX990, FX8350, MSI 660Ti. He's big on the jargon. 16 gigabytes of RAM. The 660Ti is capable of running PCI Express Generation 3. With that said, Asus just released a Generation 3 version of the Sabertooth motherboard. Is there an advantage in upgrading the motherboard to use the Gen 3 bandwidth or not? I'm going to say no. You're going to tell me whether I'm right or wrong. You are correct. The answer is no. Yes. There's no benefit. Definitely do not upgrade your motherboard specifically for this purpose. Um, the highest end GPUs today, Titan 690, 7990s from Asus, that kind of stuff, they don't really even need PCI Gen 3 either. So, no, you'll be fine. Got an email from Joe about Intel SRT technology. He says, I currently have a Samsung 840 Pro that houses my Windows 8 operating system and most of my installed programs. Nice. I also have a few two terabyte mechanical hard drives for pictures and videos, etc. Would I see any performance benefits from installing a 64 gigabyte MSATA SSD and enabling Intel's SRT? Would that depend on the frequency uh, of or how often you access the files on the mechanical drives? Yeah. Yeah, 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 pretty much. So if, you're, if your operating system and most of your applications are on the SSD already, the, the idea of SRT is it's simply acting as a cache yes. for what its algorithm, what its software determines are your most frequently used files on your spindle drives. So um, if you always if you have, open the picture of your wife, it will cache yeah. that picture. <laughs> but if you're but if it's if it's if it's like long-term storage and you're mm -hmm. only ever accessing you know a couple of things every once in a while uh unless those are things that you have already opened and it has determined it would, would speed things up then, then then no you wouldn't really see a performance advantage in any way um srt is really meant to be a operating system level device Right. right, so it's meant to be the uh, the go between for uh, I want an SSD, but I want the storage of a uh, uh, you know of a two terabyte or three terabyte hard drive, or even like a one terabyte hard drive in a mobile form factor, where you have an MSET SSD and you get some of the performance advantages of an SSD with the storage capacity right. of uh, uh, spindle based drives. But I don't I don't think it's really worth it to add that to um, you know what I would consider based on his email notes. Uh, <laughs> mechanical hard drives used for kind of like long-term storage right. if your mechanical hard drive was where your operating system and your applications lived then i would say yes if you can put an right. msata drive on your motherboard and use intel srt do it immediately like last Agreed. yesterday um because it's essentially turning it's essentially turning your existing uh uh rotating drives your your mechanical drives into hybrid drives which are going to accelerate the performance of your most used applications so yep with already having an SSD, you, you lose a lot of the joy there. Um, should we save Alex's questions for next week, or should we try to get that one in? Well, it seems like we're, you're being accosted, but um, <laughs> nope, I, nope, let, they, let's. They went to the bus stop. <laughs> oh, okay, good, good. You'll be fine then. Uh, let's save Alex's for next week. We've been okay. we we had a lot of news this week, um, so I know we've been we've been rambling on for a while already as it is. In honor of Alex and to, to get them all excited, if you have an Ultrabook question, do us a favor, fire it out to Twitch, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv or to at Ryan Shrout or at Patrick Norton. That's where you can find us on the Twitters. Uh, what's coming up on PC Pro this week, man? Um, so other than the Couch Master review that went out today, that was the most exciting content we had for me in the last 48 hours or so, um, we're working on more frame rating stuff now. We're actually doing Ooh. some video editing and some comparisons of not necessarily what you see in grass, but trying to demonstrate real world visual differences between V-Sync options. So V-Sync off versus V-Sync on versus adaptive V-Sync versus all these other options because a lot of people so far have, have kind of said that our, you know, oh, if you just enable V-Sync, it fixes all the problems with the crossfire that we found in our frame rating series. And while it fr fixes the idea of runs, we want to show that just because you enable V-Sync doesn't mean that you are getting a perfectly smooth result either. So we're, we're working on some video comparisons there. It's very difficult to, to kind of get these videos that show these exact things that you want to demonstrate. Um, so it's a lot of video recording, editing, tweaking things. Um, 
side by sides and all that kind of deal as well. And then we also have, uh, we're going to look at how hyper threading and CPU scaling affects frame rating performances as well. Whether or not, you know, turning off hyper threading seems to fix anything. The, the secret answer is that it doesn't. Um, uh -huh. And then uh, CPUs, whether uh, if our frequencies drop, does that actually improve runt performance as we turn into the CPU more into a bottleneck? It's kind of interesting stuff. It is interesting stuff. We're going to be replacing the screen on a uh, iPad 2 next week on Techzilla. Uh, no, no. It's, it's all in good fun, and it's preparing me to replace the screens on a couple of broken Galaxy S3s in the office. Uh, I know a producer and an editor here that have a broken Galaxy S3 screen, which oddly enough seems to have the same miserable to replace, uh, we call it sticky tape or double-sided tape technology or mastic if you want to get fancy. Essentially, the screens are glued <laughs> down. Uh, yeah. And so we're going to talk about the tools you use to do that without shattering the glass, destroying the LCD, and ruining the touchscreen. Um, or, or maybe we'll find out that it's really easy to ruin those devices and you shouldn't do it yourself. Uh, and we're also going to be talking about uh, some Raspberry Pi tweaks um, or basically some updated uh, uh, media playback stuff for Raspberry Pi we've been playing around with. Uh, and I suspect, but will not guarantee that there may be some cooling uh, devices nice. on next week's. You know, it's interesting is for removing those screens, the kind of glued down portions of things like that. Um, I'm probably going to order this device for a completely other purpose, a, a, a hot air gun, but a very, very, very micro hot air gun. It's, that would, it's, one, one of the side effects is to be able to run the hot air gun along the edges of screens and glue. You have the, the glue pencil together. heat gun? Yeah. I have one yeah. of those. The device you want is up at iFixit. And it's essentially the pad, the the yeah, yeah. I saw that. That's that's really cool looking. It really is. Yeah. It's 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 uh, you know, yeah. Microwaveable that's, iPad repair. It sounds ridiculous, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, they spent a year experimenting with hair dryers and heat guns and commercial heat guns, and and they finally came down to that the least traumatic way of doing it was basically, well. Watch Texilla next week. I'll show you. <laughs> That's about it for this episode of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Ship my pants. You're kidding. You can ship your pants right here. Wait. You hear that? I can ship my pants for free. Wow, <laughs> I just may ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Sorry. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. I <laughs> just ship my pants and it's very convenient. <gasps> very convenient. I just ship my drawers. I just ship my nighty. I would like to, to emphasize ship that it's man. ship, S-H-I-P. You can't find what you're looking for in store. We'll find it at Kmart.com right now and ship it to you oh. for free. <laughs> That's good. That is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 213, recorded April 11th, 2013. I just shipped my... I can't do it. <laughs>